very outset of this our meeting tonight I pray that there's going to be a flow of God's healing in every life in every life migraine headaches are leaving in the name of Jesus Congestion is leaving right now in the name of Jesus. Pains in your lower back, pains in your abdominal and in your chest area, God is healing. See, woman, she cool my Yeah, that's it. That's it, that's it, that's it. I speak to the spirit of depression to leave. I speak to the spirit of fear to leave. I speak for every attack against your mind, against your thoughts, against your belief. For those that are struggling to just have faith, to, to just believe, to just pray, to, to read the word of God, I speak healing. Right now, in the name of Jesus, the devil is a liar. The devil is a liar. We come to raise up a standard against the enemy tonight. We come to release angelic beings. We come to release the hosts of angels. I hear the sound of angels. I hear the sound of a mighty rushing wind. I hear the sound of the Spirit of God just beginning to enter home. Into rooms, into motor vehicles, into that space. Occupy that space, that whole atmosphere is beginning to shift in the name of Jesus. That every spirit of darkness, every spirit that is trying to hold the minds of people, every spirit that is trying to hold the bodies of people, we come against it in the name of Jesus. We come against principalities, we come against strongholds, we come against spiritual wickedness in high places.
your home, consuming fire, fill this house. Fill my room, fill my property, fill my city right now. Oh, God's presence is with you right now. All over, all over this place. Every nation right now, every country. Oh, hey, consuming fire. Consuming fire.
you know me more than us. So when you speak, oh God, for where are you, God? But all around us. And when I look in front of God, you're there. When I turn to the back, you're there, oh God. To my right, to my left, oh God, you all around us.
the man that was sitting at the pool of Bethesda, when he encountered Jesus, Jesus asked him, do you want to be healed? He said, there's, when the waters are stirred, there's no one that is able to take, put me into the water. Jesus said, do you want to be healed? I want you to understand, when there's a stirring of the water, when there's a move of God's spirit, you need to know how to get in. You know, know how to jump in. You know, it's like a pool of water, it's at the beach. When you get into the beach, a few people walk in cautiously. But the people that have really prepared themselves to enjoy themselves, they plunge in, they jump in. Some of the children cannonball in. Amen? You let the wave take you, you come out, you go back in. But you are there to enjoy it. You see, you can cautiously enter into this dimension. You can skeptically sit on the outside. But when the waters are stirred, something can change in your life. It's in your control how you respond. It's in your control how you would respond. It is in your control what you're going to do. But my suggestion, jump in. My suggestion, cannonball in. There's no better way than enjoying it. There's no better way than getting your ankles wet. And, but get your whole body wet. There's something about it where you'll be drenched in the presence of God. Come on. Where you'll be such into that place. I, 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 I wait for that day. I wait for that day when the body of Christ again will put away all our pretensions and put away all, 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 all our assumptions of who we think we are and what we think we deserve and come to the place where we where, where, where spirit calls out to spirit and deep calls out to deep where we don't mind what we, we don't worry about how we look and whether the tears are rolling down our face and whether the mascara is beginning to smudge and whether the lipstick is going out whether the eyeshadow is going out to the place where we begin to say Lord I'm going to get in where the men begin to lose their, their sense of this masculinity and trying to get it all together to the place where we begin to come before him and we begin to say Lord if it is you with me if it is you Like, 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 like ships bearing gifts 
beginning to dock. Beginning to dock and as they offload, spiritual households all over the city, all over the nation. This will be a faceless move of God. It will not be personality driven. There's a faceless move of God coming. It's a body move where the saints and the, the body of Christ is being equipped and we're standing and we're saying, it's us standing in the need of prayer. It's us using it. And so we pray that prayer today. If you're going to do anything in this season, don't do it without me. If you're going to use anyone in this season, use me. Use me. In this season, they will, I pray today there will be a breaking up of the fellow ground. Yes, that concepts and ideas will be removed as the presence of God ushers in. We break the spirit of complacency. The spirit of spiritual mediocrity. This place of God, let this be a season where everything that can be shaken, be shaken. If you've got to get our attention by shaking us, shake us. But get our attention. We will not be left behind. We will not be left behind. Put us on the cutting edge of what you're doing in this nation and in the nations of the earth. So you said, O oh God, in the book of Psalms, ask of me, and I will give you the nations for an inheritance. So as the Potter's House family, we ask for the nations. Let our feet step in every continent on this earth. We ask for Europe. We ask for Asia. We ask for Africa. We ask for Oceania. We ask for North America. We ask for South America. We ask for God. For nations. Not only for the nations. But we ask for a word. For the nations. Capacitate us. Place in us. That which is needed. I believe, oh God, in this season, we will see many connecting the nations. I see bridges throughout nations. Bridges. Bridges. Cross the seas. Cross mountain passes. Rivers, I see bridges. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So, Father, this evening, as we receive your word from your daughter, we thank you. Firstly, we thank you for just showing up, for just being God. This is your house. You can do as you please. Just so excited that you showed up and you showed out today. So today I pray you God over your daughter as she shares the word that there be just an outpouring of your spirit. Just anoint the word Lord. Speak to us we pray in Jesus name. Amen and amen. Amen. You may be seated. Bless the
Hallelujah. Amen. You ready to jump in? Amen. You ready to cannonball in? Amen. Wow, what a word. What a word this tonight. Just just fast, just worshiping and praising him. God can just speak in such a mighty and a powerful way to us. And God is just so good and so faithful all the time. Amen. Amen. Father, we just thank you tonight. Thank you, Lord, for your awesome presence. We feel you, oh God. We feel you, we feel you. Such a power of your presence. I pray that, God, you will bless this word. Bless this word, oh God, unto our hearts as we choose to sit at your feet tonight. Remove every distraction, every weariness, oh God. Wherever we are, even in our homes, oh God, that Father, we will be sitting glued, O oh God, to the screens, just waiting, O oh God, to receive what you have to say to us. So we thank you and give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, last week we did a, I did a teaching on the book of Ezra. And, uh, you know, we started off where we said that the Nebuchadnezzar had taken the Israelite nation into captivity. He planted the temple, destroyed it took all of the vessels, the, 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 the gold and the silver that was in it. He took the nation of Israel into Babylon. And then after a while, King Cyrus came into power. And then he decided, that, that he decided, but God had stirred up inside of him that he needs to send back the Israelite nation to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. And then we know how at the first point of uh, uh, return, there were only about 50,000 of the people that went in. And then at the latest stage, there was only about 1,700 that went in to rebuild the temple. Now the book of Ezra and Haggai and Zechariah and Nehemiah, they all are linked because the events occurred all in the same time. If you look at the history of the, of the Bible, you'll find that it is uh, events that occurred in the same time, in the same time frame. So now we find ourselves in the book of Haggai. And the people that had come over into Jerusalem to build the temple, they started to build. And after about two years, everything just went quiet. And this is where Haggai comes on the screen, on the scene, so sorry. And in Haggai chapter one and verse one, uh, chapter one and verse four it says, is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while the house of the Lord lies in ruins? We learn so many lessons from this book of Haggai. It's, a short, it's the second shortest book in the Bible, but it has such immense uh, 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 lessons for us that we as a church today can learn. And the first thing that we learn is that God requires our service. He requires our service. When we are called into the kingdom, it means that we are called to serve. Yeah. And when we are called to serve, we cannot relax and be lackadaisical or lazy or, uh, 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 or procrastinate when it comes to the kingdom matters. And here we find these people that had come out, they started to build and all of a sudden they lost interest. And they go and they build their own houses and they live as though there's, they, they don't know, they can't remember what was their calling to come into that place at that specific time. And this, I believe, is one of the most pointed questions of all scripture. Besides the one I think on Mount Carmel when, when Elijah asked, how long will you halt between two opinions? If God be God, then serve him. If God be God, then serve him. And here we find this other very, very strong question that comes against the believers and it says to them, he says, is it time for yourselves to build your panel houses while the house of the Lord lies in ruins? You know, we, we, there are some times when we, it comes in our lives where we tend to put ourselves first. Yet we say, God, it must be the center of it all. But when it comes, when we look at our lives and we think to ourselves, is God really the center? Because if God is really the center, then we won't focus on everything else, but he will be the focus. Yeah. And when he's the focus, then everything else goes into place. In 
Matthew 6, 33, it says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And then all these things will be added unto you. So it's so nice to, it's so nice for us to quote the scripture. But to say, seek first the kingdom, that means it is God's house, God's kingdom, God's work that has to be first and foremost in our hearts. Which is why when the prophet Haggai came on the scene and he saw these people that had just partly built the temple and now they're sitting in their homes which has been punished for them and the house is lying in ruins. He said, is it time for you to do that right now? God, when he gives us a, a, a mandate or he gives us a work to do, it has to be done because that's his requirement. Now all of us know when we, when we, at our workplaces, there are certain requirements. We have to do it. We don't say, oh, today I'm not just, I can't go to work today. I've got something else to do. Or I'm not going to do this assignment that was given to me because I've got other things that I have to see to at home. We don't do that. Because we know that when, uh, when something is required of us, we have to do it in order for us to get the recompense. Yeah. Isn't it? We have to, in order for us to get our salaries at the end of the month, in order for us to get the promotion, the bonuses, all of these things, we have to work what is required of us. So why don't we do it when it comes to the work of God? God challenges them and then he says in Haggai verse 1, chapter 1 and verse 8, he says, Go up to the hills and bring wood and build a house that I may take pleasure in it and that I may be glorified. He says you have to do some work to build the temple. I'm just not going to leave everything there for you. Go up to the hills, bring the wood, build the house. He says that I may take pleasure in it. We want to please God. We want God to be glorified. How is it? Not just by our praise and worship. Not just by us reading his word and devotional, but by us serving in the kingdom, building up the kingdom. We're not talking here about the physical house right now. We're talking about his work. What are we doing? What is our service that God requires of us, that God has blessed us with giftings? God has blessed us with, with uh, talents, with songs, with word, with uh, encouragement with things that we have. What are we doing with it? We have to build the kingdom. God calls us when it's hard to serve. Even when it is hard, we have to do it. And many of us, when life gets tough, we tell the tough get going. That means we leave, we release everything. Uh, but when things are going, we release everything that is of God and we concentrate on what, how we can make things better for ourselves. They were experiencing bad economic times in those days. And to obey God meant that they had to take a risk. They had to give up their time. They had to give up their resources. And they felt that they did not have enough for themselves. And what happens when we feel like we don't have enough for ourselves? We keep what we got. And we work with what we got. But the Bible says the house is lying in ruins. The reality is that in order for any ministry to work, time, resources, energy, your presence has to be there. We cannot work remotely when it comes to church. That's a hard fact. For many companies, their people can work remotely. But not when it comes to, because God wants us to be on hands on. Yeah. Your presence is so important. Your time in His presence is so important. And we have to understand that. It may not be easy for us when people are critical of what we do. We all know it, we've been through it. When you're in ministry, you've been through it. People will say things. People will say things against the ministry. They'll say things against what you're preaching. They'll say things about what you're doing as a church. But it's, we have to, 
be able to accept those critical things and still work. Here when it says that the people went, uh, they were people were critical of their work on the temple because those that had saw the, the temple in its former glory and saw how they were building it because they were not tradesmen. Mm -hmm. They were ordinary people that were called in to build. All God said is be obedient to the building. Whatever you can do with your hands, do it. I will see to the rest. And so when these people were, when people were critical of how they were building, they got discouraged. And when they got discouraged, they left everything and went and sat in their homes that they had built for themselves. It's not easy even for us in this day. But we have to put aside everything. Put aside the harsh words, put aside the criticism, put aside the fact that we may not have everything and say, Lord, here we are as your children. Disobedience will bring God's judgment upon you. It may not be an easy thing for us to hear. We like to hear about how we can prosper and how we can succeed and how God can bless us and of, of how uh, our families will be blessed from generation to generation. But disobedience brings God's judgment. In Haggai chapter 1 verses 9 to 10 it says, You looked for much, and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, declares the Lord of the hosts, because of my house that lies in ruins, while each of you busies himself with his own house. Therefore the heavens above you have withheld the dew, and the earth has withheld its produce. Look at the words that God is speaking. How many times have we heard people say, I've got more months than money? Yeah. Come on. Some of us, even in the first seven, by the seventh of the month, when the debits are gone out, we don't have much. And here it says, you looked for much, it came to a little. Because of our disobedience. And it's a, it's sometimes it's hard things for us to hear, but we have to hear it. Because it has to open up our eyes to see that God wants his kingdom to be built up. The Bible says that he's coming for a bride that is spotless and blameless. Pure, holy. And if we as the children of God, we can't work to bring it to that place, it's never going to be in that place. We learn from Haggai very, very clearly that our blessings will come with our obedience. The only solution to our disobedience is to repent. You know, I remember the days when we were growing up. And I, I can tell you almost every day or every second day, there used to be people on the street corners, some guys with the guitars that would be singing, calling people to repentance. And it reminded us of John the Baptist, of how we would say, prepare the way. Prepare the way. You know, it's sad to say that for many of us, repentance doesn't come easy. It doesn't come easy. We see how they tried here in Haggai, uh, in the book of Haggai, to cover their disobedience with sacrifice. But their sacrifices were unclean because of their disobedience. It was unacceptable because of their disobedience. And in Haggai chapter 2 and verse 17, it says, what God wanted for them to do was to turn to him. And we forget that every day we need to come before God in repentance. And for many of us, our prayers are just, thank you, Lord, bless you, bless us, Lord, bless our families, give us safe traveling, Lord, protect us, cover us under the blood. But what about those times when we stand up in anger or we say harsh words or we, we, we say things that hurt other people's feelings or when we disobey God in, in, in not following what he's, he has given us to do. What about those times when we need to come into repentance before him? And God is calling us as a church today to be 
fall down our knees before him, repenting that when he requires service of us, we are not available. Let's repent of our sins and get back to work serving God. Because you know what? When things hang over our heads, it's not easy to serve. It's not easy to serve. How many of you here know this and maybe you may not want to, to, to admit it right here and now. But it's hard for us to get on our knees before God when there's sin hanging over our heads. When there's things that we know we're guilty of doing that's not pleasing to the sight of the Lord. So we need to get back to that. I remember, you know, for me, it was, it, it's very, it was very hard for me to say I'm sorry. I used to be very stubborn somebody at, at, at some point in my life. But when God starts to work in you, it changes who you are. It changes who you are. And I could go sometimes for days without talking and admitting that I'm wrong because of the stubborn spirit. But we need to break all of that. If we say we're going, we are here to build the kingdom, let's come before God and say, Lord, if we've just been disobedient, we are repentant. Our nation needs to come before God in repentance for the things that have been allowed into the, our, our country. The things, the laws that have been passed in this country that is grieving the heart of God. We as, as the church and the kingdom of God, we need to come in repentance before God. That he will still move because there are pockets of people in this country and all over the world that are saying, Lord, we are prepared to work for you. We are prepared to build the kingdom that is in ruins. But you know what's a good thing? It's not all about bad things in Haggai. Because God helps us to serve him. This is the sequence of orders, of the order in chapter 1. God challenged their disobedience. Then they said, okay, we'll work. God stirred them up. Then they said, yes, we're going to work. And what comes before the work is God doing a work in them. That was the sequence of events. In Haggai chapter 1 and verse 14 it says, And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shiltiel, the governor of Judah, the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, and the spirit of the remnant of all the people. And they came and worked on the, ho Lord of, on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. God acted them to move along and he enabled them to come before him in obedience. It says the Lord stirred up the spirit, not only of Zerubbabel, not only of Joshua, the high priest, but the remnant of the people that had come to rebuild. You will always find when people become lackadaisical, God stirs up something amen, inside amen. of them. And this is what Pastor was talking about just earlier on. He says when the waters are stirred up, we need to jump in. God is starting to stir up the waters in this time. God just doesn't call us to serve. He empowers us to serve. He just don't tell you go and do this and leave you. God is with you all the time. That's because none of us can serve God on our own strength. We learn from Haggai that we need to receive God's help as we serve him. We need God to stir us up. God encourages us when we serve him. This is the biggest theme in, in the book of Haggai if you read through all the time. God is our encourager. Amen. So no matter what we are going through, God is our encourager. He may see us doing things that are not right. He'll bring us to the place where we will realize our wrongdoing. And then we will serve him, but he won't leave us. He encourages. It says in Haggai chapter 1 and verse 13, it says, I am with you, declares the Lord. I am with you, declares the Lord. We are not alone in this. If you are sitting in your homes or you're sitting here and you think, I am going through this all on my own, you are not. You may be one person sitting in your home and say, I'm alone, you are not. The Bible clearly says in Haggai, in verse 13, it says, 
I am with you. In chapter 2, when they were discouraged, in verses 4 and 5, it says, Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. According to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit remains in your midst. Fear not. What a powerful word coming from God to us as his children. He says, be strong, all of you people. And then he says, work. For I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. My spirit remains. Fear not. What words of encouragement. When they began to obey the Lord, in Haggai 2 and verse 19, it says, From this day on, I will bless you. It does not come with us just sitting around doing nothing. Our obedience, our being strong in God, us working, says, from this day on, I will bless you. Finally, the word the Lord encouraged Zerubbabel and made a promise, as he did concerning the house of David. He says, I will take you, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shintil, declares the Lord, and make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord of hosts. What a promise. He says, because I've stood up inside of you and you have caused the people to start working and doing the work of the Lord, and you're giving them uh, encouragement, he says, I will give you, I will make you like a signet ring. You know what a signet ring was? It had a stamp on it. And that stamp in the old days, it, it, it says that it, it, it was a signet ring, it had the stamp of the king. And every document that went out was, was dipped in wax and was placed onto any uh, document and it sealed it as the king sending it out. And so he says, Zerubbabel, I'm going to make you as a signet ring because I've chosen you. That means the stamp of approval is on every one of us. God's stamp of approval. We're not working on our own. We're not speaking on our own. We're not doing things on our own. We're doing it because God has given us that stamp of approval. We are branded by him. When people see us, they just know this is a child of God. God values your work. You need to know that today. God values you. It comes out so clearly in Haggai chapter 2 and verse 3. God says, and God said, the temple is as nothing. In verse 7 and 8 it says, and God promised great, great glory for what they were doing. It would be more glorious than the previous temple. The latter will be greater than the former. We're always singing that song. We're always declaring it over the kingdom of God right now. We know of the moves of God in the past, but God is saying to us today that there's something that is coming up for us that's going to be greater than any move of God that we have seen. Like Pastor was saying, he says, the, the devil only knew what COVID-19 was going to stir up in our hearts as believers. He would not have brought this disease and this pandemic upon the earth. He thought he would destroy us, but it brought something inside of us. It stirred something inside of us that said we will live and we will not die. Amen. Amen. And so the time has come for the church to arise. The time has come for us to say we are going to be kingdom builders Amen. in this day and age. It does not matter. We may be a remnant, but we are going to build. We are going to build. And you know what? The important thing is this, is that when, when Jesus, when God was speaking, uh, when the people fretted about what they had to build the temple, God said to them, I will give you the silver and the gold. We think we do not have enough. We serve a God of the miraculous. We serve the God who is our provider. He is the one who holds the cattle on a thousand hills. He owns the thousand hills. He's the God of the heavens and the earth. He is the one that will say to, to us today as a church, you do what I have called you to do. With what little you have, be faithful. Yeah. And I will put in the silver. 
silver and the gold and I am going to make this church and this kingdom of, of God in this time to be glorious because it's my kingdom. Amen. It's not our kingdom that we are building. It's not our houses that we are building. When we get that right in our heads and we say, Lord, you need part in service of us. Here I am. Use me. Here am I. Send me. I pray today that, you know, when we look initially, when we look at the book of Haggai, we see a lot of, uh, about, there's a lot of dis disappointment and discouragement. But it ends up on such a beautiful note. And I, I pray today that you will take that home. To know that when we come before God in obedience, we serve Him with everything that we have. God encourages us, God provides, and God will do what we cannot do to make His kingdom to be glorious in this time. So the Bible says the latter will be greater than the former. We believe in that. Great times ahead of us in the kingdom of God. Great times. And we all need to be stirred up at this time even in, in, in the kingdom of God. Let's just bow our heads in the word of prayer. Father, we come before you today. Oh God, we thank you for this awesome calling upon our lives. We do not take it lightly tonight, oh God, what you have called us to do in this time. And Lord, when you spoke to Esther, when you spoke to Esther, Lord, you said, if, we, if she will not do it, oh God, in this time, you would raise up another. We do not want you, oh God, to raise up others when we are here, oh God. We are willing, oh God, to serve you. We are willing, oh God, to do what you have called us to do, Lord. In whatever capacity. It may be little, it may be much, but in your eyes, oh God, it's great. And so we thank you today. Thank you, Lord, for this word of encouragement. Thank you that you are our encourager. Yes. And you help us, oh God, in our times of serving you. So we give you praise and honor you in Jesus' mighty name.